Hey, Dad was... worked for Nestle. Dad worked for Nestle, mate. The, the, the pre kick out today didn't really work too well. <laughs> this is potentially the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. And, and that's saying something because there's been some stupid stuff in the history. For me, what was the most rewarding? Just learning people stuff out of them. And also being given this platform to be able to stand up and represent you know, people of my time. The only way really to, do, to kick poverty into the butt at all is I should back here. It's a week for you. I mean, you know, it's a big deal. All right, it's my pleasure now to welcome on founder of TX Active, Jade Mitchell. Jade, how are you today? Good, thanks, Chris. How are you? I'm great, thank you. So, <laughs> before we get into TX Active and the aim of the brand, we really need to touch on your incredible story. So, you were born with cystic fibrosis and you're a double lung transplant recipient i guess for those who don't know anything about cystic fibrosis maybe just give us a bit of a background on it and how it affects people yep so it's a primarily a lung disease and it's a recessive genetic thing so both parents have to be a carrier of the gene to, in order to have a child with cystic fibrosis in saying that there may be no family history so um, there is genetic screening for it now, so you can check whether you're a carrier or not, mm. and it is offered to people as well when they're pregnant. So um, my advice would be to have a check. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not, not always cheap, but, yeah. And then when I was born um, back in the 70s, there was no carrier screening, so mm-hmm. um, I was born with cystic fibrosis. There was no history in our family, and a lot of people... So it seemed to be in that scenario who are about my age now. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, primarily a lung disease, a degenerative condition of the lungs, but it affects the pancreas and um, digestive systems and um, the transfer of salt within the cells. So um, we burn a lot more energy. You need to have pancreatic enzymes when you have your food and it requires a lot of IV antibiotic admissions in hospital pretty much throughout your whole life. Yeah. That's crazy. So basically, like, since birth, you've been in and out of hospital. I guess this is going to be, like, a really broad question, but um, what was your childhood like with all that factored in, and what was Jade like as a child? Yeah, pretty busy, apparently. <laughs> I think my uh, grade of a prep report or something said that I was like a bottle of lemonade that had been shook up, and then once you – sometimes you need to let the lid off. <laughs> so I was a bit crazy. Um, my brother, he – was also had cystic fibrosis and he was the same, but he had actually ADHD yeah. as well. Um, but, yeah, we're, we were both pretty busy. Um, so it didn't stop us in that regard. But I did have to have medications like mm. from when I was born right through, especially the pancreatic enzymes. So um, when I first went to school, the suggestion from the principal to my parents was a um, small private school in Tasmania was that, oh, maybe we should be going to a special school um, for disabled children rather yeah. than um, able-bodied school, which now, you know, th- thankfully a lot of disabled people get integrated into school, mm. so that's great. But, yeah, they didn't think that they could take on me having to have the medication during the day when I ate food. Um, so mum used to put that in my sandwiches and that's also all my friends. She used to wrap it up in the glad wrap or in the packaging yeah. in the lunchbox and all my friends used to sit around. You used to sit at your desk and yeah. eat your lunch. All my friends used to fight over who was going to give me my medication. <laughs> I want to give her her tablets today. It's like hidden in the sandwich and your friend goes, you're like, oh, no, 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 you don't no, want you're that. you're not allowed to have those <laughs> ones. Yeah, so just a lot of, um, yeah, the... If you didn't have the enzymes, you used to get a lot of stomach aches and bowel problems. If um, so, that was probably the major thing when I was at school. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a few bowel obstructions throughout my childhood as well, which are pretty excruciating, mm. and painful. Um, had to go to hospital for those. But I think I figured out once I missed in my schooling life two years of school through being in hospital admissions. Wow! Um, just through each admission was seven days minimum, mm-hmm. up to fourteen days. So often that had to fall within school time. Um, try, mum used to try and do it in school holidays, but then you're spending your whole holidays yeah. in hospital, so that sucks. Um, but, yeah, in and out of hospital my whole life and all my friends sort of knew about it. I went to the same school from kinder through to year 12. Mm-hmm. So um, that was a bonus. I never had to explain it to anybody, all the friends that were with me, they at knew. least 12 of us, yeah, from kinder yeah. to year 12. So they used to explain it to any yeah. new person that was like, weird. What's wrong with Jade? Why is she coughing all the time? Or yeah, 
you you say it so like nonchalant, like you know, two years, but I guess it's you know you, it's it's almost all you all you know really. Yeah, I think I've had discussions with other CF people before who say the same thing. Like we yeah. we sort of talk about it just off the back as it's just normal for us. Yeah. Um, whereas other people go, hang on, wait, what? <laughs> You're you spend two weeks in hospital a couple of times a year. That's bizarre. And then as I got older, it was more and more and more time because mm. the lungs get infected you go in you have your iv antibiotics to mm. sort of fix that infection but the scarring that gets caused is what creates the damage yeah and then over time yeah that damage is irreparable and then ultimately i had the lung transplant mm-hmm. so you you mentioned your brother joe there who was also born with cystic fibrosis sadly he passed away at 23 how special was he to you and important to to you and you know dealing with the exact same disease yeah well we you know in our house i guess there was no difference there there's a Mm. lot of kids that have got siblings with cf that they don't have it themselves or Mm. vice versa um so for us we both had it so home life was just dealing with that um you know we used to do physio exercise mum used to make us it was it wasn't an excuse to do less it was yeah. more of a reason to have to do more mm-hmm. so we were always pretty active mum used to send us to swimming lessons my brother did taekwondo he ended up being a black belt in taekwondo by the time he was like 12 Jeez. <laughs> so he was on the uni taekwondo mm. team uh, roller hockey he did yeah he was on the uni roller hockey team yeah. um when he was that age and coming to melbourne for a state champ thing yeah so yeah we did we were always active to just mm. keep the lungs healthy mm-hmm. so but yeah my great having a sibling and mm. um having a sibling with cf i don't know whether or not it was a hindrance or not mum no. once put us into hospital at the same time and uh, the sibling rivalries didn't really work out so well for herself yeah i was like oh you're always spending time with him and not with me. Yeah. And then he was like, oh, she's so annoying. Hang out with me. Yeah. So I guess that was tricky. More for my parents. When your kids, you don't really notice it. It is what it is. Mm. Um, but it was probably harder on my parents than it was, particularly mum. My dad was always working full time. But they were both medical as well. So, mm. um, yeah, I guess that was the, the tricky situation for them rather than for us. We just... It was a normal childhood as far as all, I felt. It was all you, it's all you both knew. Yeah, well, that's it, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned there that you, yeah, before that you, you know, you were put onto the transplant list. Now, you got put on that in 2018. Now, obviously, you've had to battle with this for so long up until that point. Um, I'd love to know how your how your mind was once you found out that you were going on the list and sort of in that transition period before actually getting it like you've had it's obviously such a long wait and then you can sort of see that you know the finish line or not the finish line but like you know a big event is sort of just around the corner now yeah well um so yeah my whole life people used to say oh so what happens with cystic fibrosis and there is no cure currently so Mm -hmm. Um, the response was always like, oh, well, you know, you keep your, keep healthy for as long as you can and then, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the road you have a lung transplant if you're eligible for it. And um, I never really truly gave much thought to that until the last couple of years before I needed the transplant. Mm-hmm. And in that time, you'd, I mean, I've always done everything I can to um, not have to get to that point or to stay as healthy as possible. Yeah. But, um, you know, through my 30s I had 50% lung function um, and then that sort of dropped down to the 40s and I got a big couple of viruses or mm. colds and flus and that sort of damaged it more and you don't bounce back. So each time you lose a little bit more lung mm. function, it's very, very hard to get it back no matter what you do you be, could be trying your hardest and exercising every day and going to the gym as much as you can and you it know, just doesn't repair itself no then you just get a cold and you end up you know back in hospital yeah. with a bad lung function again and you're like that whole last six months where i was doing so well has just been wiped off mm. <laughs> we'll start again yeah. so it, you're always trying to better yourself but it's always not really getting you any gains yeah um whereas then when they say to you oh you know you need to look at having a lung transplant I um, had to really put my faith in the doctors and you've got a team of doctors that have been with you for that whole time once you go to the adult 
um, wards at the different hospital, children's hospital, then you transfer to an adult hospital. Um, then that team had been with me for, you know, my whole adult life. Yeah. So they, you, you get a lot of trust in them and I had yeah. to sort of go with their word. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, they want you to keep your own organs for as long as possibly possible. Yeah. Because um, you don't have problems with rejection or you've got all your CF problems. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I had to really put my faith in them because I was – I didn't really realise how unwell I was. I mean, I knew I had yeah. 28% lung function and I could walk around the park with my dog and get really out of breath and need a few rests or yeah. walk from my house, which is like 800 metres from Chapel Street, and it would take me 20 minutes sometimes. Now it takes me six minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I'd have to ring my husband and say, can you pick me up? Yeah. Because I've got the groceries, but I couldn't possibly walk back with them. Mm. So... I, that was a normal day for me and I used to think, oh, but I'm fine, I'm walking around. Yeah. And um, they refer you to the transplant team, which is a different team, completely separate, a lot of doctors. Yeah. They all work together but um, they assess you and um, the assessment is really long. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's heaps and heaps and heaps of tests to do. But, um, yeah, they sort of gave me the – scenario in saying that you know you're driving along the great ocean road um you know there's a cliff on one side (laughs) and in the next virus or cold or flu that you get you could knock off that cliff and maybe not come back in ground and in road again yeah um and not get those gains and be on the safety of the inner roads um so we would suggest that you you get on the the list yeah I was going to I was going to say what and probably a silly question but at what percentage of you know having your lung capacity is like the like the the lowest that you can really go before they're like this is this can't go any lower cuz 28% doesn't seem like a lot No well that's it um, it's different for everybody some people um that's it there is no set rule and yeah. that's one of the things I think is possibly hard for the cystic fibrosis team at the hospital to engage and bring up with people because a lot of people either everybody with cystic fibrosis everybody without it is different Mm -hmm. so the way people um react to certain news is different as well yeah um so they don't really have a set um guideline i don't think Mm -hmm. um which is one of the things so i sort of asked like what you know when's it going to be that i might need to transplant some people might have 50 percent lung function and they just mm. feel that they can't do they can't do the daily tasks and they're not feeling great and mm. you know that's awful and they can't walk up flights of stairs whereas um yeah i sort of got to the 28 mark and was told you know you're this not is, great. Yeah. i'd say but at 50 they might have a conversation with you saying try and stay up here yeah 30s it's like I'm trying. Definitely, like I'm definitely doing my best. a yeah. conversation. Yeah. And under 30, you know, I do know people who have been on the list that their last like lung function test was like 18. Wow. But they're on oxygen. They've got a walking frame often. Yeah. Um, they're not feeling great. And that was one of the things the transplant team said to me. Like, do you look around the waiting room and see people with these aids, oxygen and wheelchairs and things, and think, well, I'm not at that stage yet, so I don't need a transplant. Yeah. That was part of my thinking yeah and they said well we don't want you to get to that stage. yeah exactly so yeah. you know great for people that are at that stage and are still hanging on and doing mm. their best but um yeah they in my case said you know we think that we should list you now and um see how you go but even once you're on the list yeah it, it takes a good three four months of testing for them to do all the tests to yeah, get right. you on the list and then once you're on the list you could be on the list for 12 months or longer yeah. or a really short amount of time, which for me was six weeks. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. what um, you mentioned like the, the, like the testing and all that sort of the, the assessment, like go, go into like what that sort of entails. Yeah. So they try to do it over one full day, but ultimately that's when it's sort of a bit of a, right, you've got to get on the list in the next month. Um, mm. Whereas I had a bit longer, so they did the test, but they literally do full body scans, CT scans to check you don't have any cancers anywhere else, Mm -hmm. Um, jaw scans to check all your teeth and your molars and all that stuff to see you don't have any infection in your teeth Mm. or your gums, Um, like check your eyesight because you go on large doses of steroids and those sorts of things, you know, can change your eyesight Mm. over time. So they basically want to get a full baseline of 
who you are. Yeah. Um, they literally do scans of, I had a lung transplant, so the chest cavity to see what size lungs you would be you able need. to be compatible with. Yeah. Um, I had a large chest cavity, so I could do male or female lungs, okay. they thought. So, um, yeah, blood types, tissue types, just absolutely everything. Because if you've got some unknown little skin cancer yeah. um, and then you go have – a transplant and you're on anti-rejection medication, your body won't fight, even though it won't fight a skin cancer easily anyway, um, it's more likely to blow up and yeah, you know, be catastrophic. A, yeah. So they want to make sure that, that even though you're not healthy and fit, mm. that you're the best possible candidate to be able to do well post-surgery. Yeah. So after the transplant, you you had some issues and ultimately went back to hospital and you are in a coma in July um, of 2019 I'm not going to ask you about that but something you told me which genuinely left me like gobsmacked is after being out of the coma and in September you went skiing yeah you went skiing despite not being able to walk upstairs now how did you get the doctors to sign off on this or is it like a <laughs> was it like on the hush hush it was a little bit on the hush hush I didn't mention it to the rehab team um yeah I it was my second lot of rehab, so I did the transplant rehab after the transplant, mm. and um, it's three months of rehab, yeah. three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then, um, yeah, I then had the coma and had to do the rehab again, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and got to the point where my husband had been gifted some skis by my family for his 40th, yeah. and I felt bad that I'd been asleep for the whole of his birthday and three and a half weeks in a coma was... Um, yeah, so you should feel bad for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to taken a toll on everyone. I was like, oh, it's unfair, you should how's, get to the snow. How selfish of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just sort of said, oh, we should go up to the snow and you should have a ski, but throw my boots in anyway, he's like... No, I'm not throwing your boots in. I was like, just put them in the car. Yeah. And I just thought oh, I'd go up the lift and have a look around, maybe have a coffee. Ski to coffee, we call yeah. it. But, um, yeah, um, got up the lift and thought, oh, I'll do a beginner run and mm-hmm. didn't do too badly. There's something about going downhill versus going uphill. I guess the muscle memory kicked in and yeah. I did six runs and I, I took it easy. I didn't power down the mount, although – Maybe I sort of did towards the end of it. But it was it was hard work. My legs were shaking at the bottom and then yeah. I would sit there while they all did another sort of two laps yeah. and then I'd go again and then I went in for a coffee and I took it easy. So in terms of where you do six runs in an hour, yeah. I probably did six runs in the whole morning and then yeah. went in. And then I was suitably exhausted. So Yeah, understandable. That's let's I mean let's did you want to get into skiing like I know we had like a discussion about how I spent so much time in Canada and n- never even done it. Like, has skiing just been something that you've like always done and just loved? Yeah, yeah. Um, as kids, my we were lucky to have my dad's sister, my aunt, um, mm. had a ski lodge up there, and my family had my grandparents had a little log cabin at mm. Mount Beauty, which is below Falls Creek. So yeah. we'd stay in the log cabin or sometimes stay at my auntie's lodge. So. Mm. Um, we used to go skiing each year yeah. from Tasmania over to Victoria, which was great. And I did do a couple of part-time seasons ski instructing yeah. um, at Falls Creek as well. So that was that was great. So I've always loved it. And even pre-transplant, when they were saying you need to go on the transplant list, I um, we had a holiday to Japan booked. Yeah. And specifically Japan because the mountains – they get the most amount, amazing amount of snow, the mm. Japau, the Japanese pow, <laughs> okay. um, powder snow is phenomenal. And um, so we booked to go there over somewhere like France because of the altitude. I wouldn't have been able to breathe yeah. at the altitude. Um, so we went to Japan. The mountains are much lower, but they still get this amazing – it's actually really the same height as the mountains in Australia, but they get this amazing mm. snow. So I went there um, <laughs> under doctor's – not really their advice, but, um, yeah, I mentioned that I wanted to go and they said, mm. oh, we don't think that's a wise idea. No. It went there before the transplant because yeah. I was like, oh, you know, this could be my last skiing trip. With, yeah, these, you never know. with these set of lungs. Yeah, that's it. I've got to give them a send-off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I hired oxygen to take and had a backpack to carry the oxygen around on in case yeah. I needed it and had, like, a portable machine. But the weight of that and then the fact that I was very out of breath anyway yeah. – 
was a bit much. So I, I felt that I knew my body better by just feeling out of breath and knowing yeah. to stop than having to lug the oxygen around. But I did take all of that stuff with me. Yeah, that, <laughs> that is absolutely crazy. So many people in that situation would just be like, no, nah, but you were just like, oh, that's all right, I'll, I'll – I'll throw oxygen in the bag, like we'll we'll be we'll, sweet. We'll give it a go. Yeah, and you're like to the doctors, we're not going to France, don't worry. We're going yeah. we're going to Japan. Yeah. It's so much so much better for me. That's you. My doctor said, Oh, I studied in Japan as well and I worked there. But I said, Oh great, so you speak Japanese. Perfect. If so anything you, goes wrong then yeah, it should know. make you feel more comfortable. Yeah. I said, Look, I'm not gonna be stupid. If I can't breathe at the altitude, then we'll spend longer in the cities and not go skiing, but I was fairly confident that I would, but it's quite amazing. I haven't actually been able to properly ski with the new lungs because I've mm. had the setbacks, mm-hmm. but um, just the day-to-day things that I can do now compared to what I couldn't do before when I thought that I was okay, yeah. um, like just walking upstairs without mm. getting breathless, I can now run up the stairs and yeah. not get anywhere near as breathless as I used to. So yeah. I guess yeah. Get into that. Like you know, obviously the, the yeah the the issue with them when you sort of a year after you got the lungs put in, but now that you know it sort of has settled down. Like talk about like everyday life and how it's just made things you know better, and and sort of maybe touch on some things that you couldn't do before that you can sort of do now. Yeah. So I used to always try to get out um, pre transplant to walk the dog and to do a little bit of exercise, mm-hmm. but literally like vacuuming or making the bed and doing a load of washing, like those things that required you to carry something that wasn't even that heavy and put it in the washing machine. That felt like such a huge effort. Whereas yeah. now I could throw in a load of washing as I'm running out the door and hit yeah. go and then hang it up in two seconds before I cook dinner. I can't Whereas even do that. All those things just <laughs> felt like such a huge yeah. effort before. Like, like I said, walking, you know, a six-minute walk to the train station – was like, oh, felt could sometimes take me 20 minutes and I'd yeah. be out of breath and needing to sit down. Uh, going upstairs to get a jumper, I was like, oh, God, I've got to get upstairs. And I used to, the pressure in my lungs and the, the damage um, and the lack of function, I used to get this thing called hemoptysis where I'd cough up blood because mm. the blood cells into the lungs or the little tiny capillaries would burst. So just going up a flight of stairs or bending over to do my shoelace up, I'd end up coughing up blood yeah. for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Every night I'd have to lay myself down on multiple layers of pillows and then take one away, one away, one away because sometimes I'd lie straight down and then have to be sitting up coughing up blood. Yeah. So those things no longer happen. I could literally run. Incredible. Got, got to the point of running around the famous tan track here okay. in uh, Victoria, yeah. around the Botanical Gardens. Um, not in a great time. Doesn't but matter. Haven't been able to run like pretty much my whole life. So, do you remember yeah. the first the first time you completed it? Yeah. Yeah. How, how good was that? Yeah, it was great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it still took me, I like, it was a walk jog, let's put it that yeah. way for some people. Still took me like 28 minutes or something, but I haven't done that since I was, oh, I don't know. Probably been fifteen years, so yeah, yeah, yeah. People are like looking at you. You're like happy, and they're like, oh, "I'd love to." Like, don't just worry. Basically, just everything that's just so easy yeah. now was what I didn't realize a massive struggle before. Yeah, like it's amazing how much your body can push through. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, when it's struggling, but compared to now, it's like no, it's nothing. light years apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. completely. And I'm I'm at 85% lung function now, so I'm still not at 100. I might not ever get to 100, but because of the setback that I had, I went right back down to nothing. Um, I had to literally learn to sit, talk, walk, everything again. So um, that was a major, major setback. They Mm -hmm. didn't think that I'd maybe get better than 50% lung function or 30%. Mm -hmm. I thought when I came out of it, great, I have to go through this whole transplant thing again. Yeah, But luckily... I somehow miraculously came back. I've got a good, strong set of lungs. Yeah. So, yeah, we bonded through the through the big sleep, I call it, the coma. Yeah. All right, let's move into TX Active now. Um, a beautiful mutual friend of ours, Ginny, started telling me about this story and um, this idea that you had, and it's, it is honestly incredible. So tell us about TX Active and when did this idea really sort of start to formulate in your mind? Yeah, so I... Pre-transplant, um, had been nannying. 
I did early childhood mm -hmm. studies at uni and then got to the point where looking after young snotty children wasn't a great idea and launched a drink bottle business because I couldn't work full time and mm -hmm. I was getting sicker and sicker. And then um, those sort of became everywhere. So during the transplant recovery, I was thinking, what am I going to do after this? Like, world's yeah. my oyster sort of thing. Yeah. And then uh, in rehab gym, which is the three-month gym that you have to go to, um, post-transplant, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that um, – just sort of looked around. I wore my active wear and noted that some of the older people were wearing their jeans and boat shoes or jeans and sneakers and button-up shirt or that there were people on the leg press machine wearing tracksuit pants and a jumper. But, like, it seemed obvious to me that there was sort of, like, outfits from their pre-transplant lives yeah. that they hadn't really assimilated into that now I've got these new organ parts that mm. I, you know, can push myself a bit harder and knowing what it's like, in the lead up to it, you've tried to maintain for your whole life. You've never really had any gains. So for the first time in such a long period of time, if not ever, you're now actually getting gains. Mm -hmm. So I'd been made aware of that by the people around me that you're going to get gains now. So I sort of treated it like a personal training session. Yeah. Whereas a lot of people weren't in that mindset. They were still going to a hospital to a hospital appointment. And so I think that, yeah, me wearing the active wear, people would look at me and think that I either worked there mm -hmm. or that I was there for some other rehab and not to do with organ transplant. Mm -hmm. And they would outwardly say, oh, you don't look like you should be here or what are you doing here or, mm -hmm. oh, you know, do you work here? Yeah. <laughs> so those sorts of comments and the response that I was getting from people that, you know, fake it till you make it, mm -hmm. look good, feel good sort of thing really resonated. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the other group that I was going through with started to, oh, I went and bought these leggings from the mm -hmm. op shop and now I'm wearing them. So, yeah, just sort of changed their mindset a bit too. And then when you realise you can do more and more and more, mm -hmm. um, you know, it only seems natural. And I've had comments from people who have been in that situation prior to me going, oh, I never even thought of wearing active wear. So simple now, of course. Like yeah. ac Activity is such a huge part of keeping your new organs, you know, for as long as you can and being active is key mm -hmm. that, um, you know, why wouldn't you think of wearing active wear to do a yeah. session? But it's just not in the forefront of people's minds yeah. at all. Well, talk, talk about that and what it might seem to most people as a very small or, you know, it might not actually be that significant in having someone's mindset from going from I'm going to the hospital to I'm actually going to say the gym and like how much that aids and, you know, brings confidence. Yeah. So the gym's an intimidating place for a lot of people, regardless yeah. of pre or post transplant or mm. being completely healthy mm. um, and just wanting to get fit or lose a bit of weight. So um, turning up to the gym in the hospital for the first time is a massive step because you've been discharged from hospital, but you're required for three months to come back yeah. and do this program. So that's intimidating. And then when you get there, um, the intimidation is that there's people who are at the end of their three months and right through to the beginning of their three months, but you don't know through looking around mm. what, what stage people are at. So some people might seem that they are well more advanced than you, so that's a little bit intimidating as well. And uh, I guess that um, at the end of every week on a Friday, um, the head of the gym used to do a little send-off for everybody. Mm -hmm. So they'd say, oh, congratulations, Chris. You know, mm -hmm. you came in here walking 50 metres on oxygen and you've walked out of here doing 500 metres with yeah. no oxygen. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. But on the first week that you arrive, there's no real introduction of Chris has just arrived. Yeah. He's new. You know, let's give him a pat on the back. So I wanted to sort of encourage people to say, well done, oh, Chris, you've just arrived. Mm. You know, Jade's on her way out. She's yeah. achieved this. You can get there too. Yeah. It's all about activity now. And so here's a T-shirt, a jumper, some mm. shorts, whatever it is that they choose from the TX Active packs that we'll be gifting to the hospital, to, mm -hmm. to the transplanters, um, to just get them – in that mindset of, you know, you're not in hospital now, you're home yeah. or you're in accommodation and you're coming back. Like this is to prepare you to 
get to the gym yourself in the outside world and, you know, you can wear this to the gym and you can be more comfortable, you can work hard, Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So it's just not in the forefront of people's minds that, oh, I best go out and get some active wear. Yeah. And also they've been underemployed or unemployed for such a long period of time as well. They don't have the spare income. Families don't have the spare income Mm. really. It's not cheap as well. No, and good-looking functional active wear you can you can go to a cheap department store and get something cheap, but it doesn't really last. So mm-hmm. we're trying really hard to be nice to the planet and yeah. uh, use high end recycled plastic um, products in our active wear. Mm-hmm. And the big thing to me was to make it not look like a charitable um, product and to have it appeal to the masses, so to create a logo and a brand that was about strength and community and purpose Mm -hmm. so that, you know, you could not have a transplant and be an absolutely everyday regular person wandering around and go, oh, I'm happy to wear this because this purchase gifts it to somebody else and it doesn't feel like it's a token charity piece of clothing that it actually fits in with active wear that is fashionable and people want to wear going to the gym. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. So you, you mentioned it a couple of times. So just explain exactly what. So currently it's a Kickstarter campaign. So explain, you know, sort of what that is and, you know, ultimately sort of when people purchase, um, you know, when they purchase clothing, like what what you're, what the company, what you are doing in return. Yeah, so uh, we every two purchases will gift the same purchase to somebody who's had a transplant. We wanted to start with the heart and lung transplants because mm-hmm. uh, that's my experience in that gym, and um, then extend it to all transplanters as bigger as it goes. The more we can give, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But basically, um, taking inspiration from other companies that are give back companies that mm-hmm. um, your purchase gifts somebody. So you know, why go buy a regular item from a regular sports shop when you mm-hmm. can buy? equal quality but be giving back at the same time so that's the that's the goal we hope to get to one to one eventually yeah but you know as a startup and a small business the minimum order quantities are small for those sorts of things and the margins are therefore out of whack a bit to be able to do the one for one yeah but um hopefully we'll get there as, as bigger as it grows the more we can give and the bigger we can become yeah yeah that's it how how important you know was you know doing something like this of the fact that you know you've literally been through this entire process and uh experience that the people you're gifting um you know go through so you know firsthand just sort of how difficult you know this whole process is yeah so that's um part of the reason i've always felt that i'm better off doing jobs and things for other people yeah <laughs> and that's what sort of motivates me more mm-hmm. i could easily go in and tidy someone's kitchen and cook a meal for four kids and do all those sorts of things for other people mm-hmm. and i'm not always awesome at doing it for myself so yeah. motivation to be doing something that gives back makes me far more driven and, you know, having the purpose of giving back to people that I know what they've been through and that I've experienced firsthand is what will help drive that for me, I think. Yeah. Um, That was one of the major things. Mm -hmm. And I also just wanted to create something that, you know, had a purpose. I did the drink bottle thing in the past and that was great for the environment and all of those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to do an environmental thing that gave back and that was fun to do. So Yeah. Yeah. Uh, talk about the talk about the the actual, you know, you've been uh, discharged from the hospital and then coming having to come back to the hospital to do the rehab. Is that a tough is that a tough thing and did you find that that you know, the fact that people are wearing, you know, average clothes, they're kind of seeing it as like, I thought I was discharged from the hospital and now I'm just coming back, you know, when will this ever end, that sort of thing? Yeah, well, I bumped into a guy actually, had to pick up some medication today and I saw him and he had the full shakes from the anti-rejection drugs that you get and he was fiddling around with his prescriptions at the hospital pharmacy Mm -hmm. and um, he said, oh, I'm getting up, just heading up to the heart transplant gym and I said, oh, well, say hi from me. Yeah. And he sort of looked funny at me and I could just pick from his body language 
exactly what he was doing through the shapes and the medications yeah. and those sorts of things. And it took me back to being at that time. And I was like, wow, if only he could understand. I know his mindset, he was not going to be able to understand that. He looked at me sort of a bit weirdly going, oh, what are you doing? Because I looked more said, I don't have the shakes anymore. I've been through the process of um, the rehab. And he looked a bit stunned, I guess, that mm-hmm. I knew where he was going. So, yeah, coming back into the hospital after you've been discharged to go to the transplant gym Mm -hmm. is, um, for me, it was a bit easier because I lived in such close proximity to the hospital anyway Mm -hmm. that I could literally walk there. Um, It took me a few minutes to walk there, whereas a lot of people, Victorian transplant at the hospital do Victoria, Tasmania and South Australia so those families are living in Victoria and staying in accommodation, so mm-hmm. hotel accommodation or small apartment accommodation with their full-time carer, which is usually their family member, yeah. and then still having to come back those three days a week to the hospital. So for them, having to live away from home, away from family. That journey is living, nowhere near over in their mind. No. So they're still treating it as, okay, I've got to get through this, then I can go home. So a lot of people are still displaced from their home yeah. whilst doing the rehab. Whereas for me, I was lucky. I just lived up the road um, and my whole family saw that as just worth – well, didn't have a worth on it really. It was yeah. just amazing to be that close. It made it so much more convenient. But So even people living as far away as just past Geelong, if you're 100 plus kilometres away from the hospital, they'll give you hospital-based accommodation nearby. Mm -hmm. So you're still displaced for a long period of time. Mm. Um, So it's still tricky because you've got to get a car park. You you can't often walk that distance, even though it's in close proximity, because you haven't built up the strength yet. This is all about building up your strength to be able to just go home and function fairly normally. Even when you get home, you've still got a road to recovery. You don't feel – I didn't feel fantastic until Mm. a good six months eight months further along the track. Yeah. But this is just to get you to a base level to be you so know, you can, pretty pretty strong. Yeah. Um, obviously feeling way better than you were pre-transplant, but everybody's journey is different as well. So some people have all sorts of setbacks and complications. Um, things don't go so smoothly. They mm-hmm. might have medication reactions. They might have had complex problems during surgery yeah. that require all sorts of different health things they might have had, you know, kidney failures due to the medications that they're now on. So countless things can go wrong. Everything can go right and smoothly, but Mm. um, ultimately everybody's progress and everybody's journey is different. So being able to assist people with giving them something to help them think about activity outside of the hospital and looking the part is, for me, something that can change the mindset out of hospital to I'm heading home rather than, oh, I've got to keep coming in here to finish this. It's just like, wow, I can prepare to get out of here and be going to a regular gym or doing regular exercise elsewhere. Yeah. I had a really good question that I asked uh, Josh Young, who's uh, uh, someone I had on recently, who's uh, became a paraplegic. And I asked him, uh, talk about the difference between say going from, hospital rehab to actually going to the gym where you say you're like you wake up and you're like I'm gonna go to the gym today like talk about how much of a difference that makes I think I stumped him with this question when I asked him yeah uh well I guess for my personal experience and uh is that you're on such huge amounts of anti-rejection medication Mm. and when you're in hospital going to the hospital gym, you're wiping down all the equipment with alcohol wipes and sprays and all that sort of stuff. So for me personally, this was pre-COVID, so my thoughts of going back to a big regular gym was like, oh, it's going to be filthy. I could get sick just going here. There's going to be people with germs. Oh, what am I going to do? So that was my biggest freak out. Yeah. Now, actually, one of the not many benefits of COVID, but it has made the world aware of the fact that um, immunocompromised people are around us, walking mm-hmm. around looking like any the rest of us, and that we need to keep some distance and be mm. respectful and clean products and wash hands and do those sorts of things. So 
that's actually a bonus mm -hmm. <laughs> that is now – I mean, all gyms have had sprays and wipes and you bring your own towel for years, but plenty of people don't obey by that. So yeah. going into a big complex gym was – that was the main forefront of my mind, actually, yeah. <laughs> was that. But other than that, it was like, wow, I can do a full class again and, yeah. like, let's see how this goes. My my excitement came from, oh, I know what I could do before. Let's mm. see what I can do now and let's yeah. see. My excitement came from finding how my body reacted and finding out how much easier it was or what things were easier and what things were difficult. And, yeah. and then each time I went, how much easier it got each time. Yeah. Because even though, like I said before, doing the CF stuff post or pre transplant, it was, you know, a big slog to mm -hmm. just maintain. Whereas to get there and gain each time you go, yeah. Pretty cool. But yeah, main the main thing for me is just the cross infection risk. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> com that's completely understandable. Coming up with the idea is obviously one thing, but when did it really sort of start to take shape that you know, you've like, okay, I want to do this, but now you're like, I'm doing this. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll just start out with ordering some samples. Mm -hmm. So, and then I was like, oh, but if I'm going to order some samples, maybe I need to have a logo. So if I want it to be a strong sort of brand that it doesn't have, you know, totally a health meaning that everybody could, you know, use and not associate it necessarily with transplant at a glance, yeah. um, that would be great. So I sort of put out to some designers to do a logo and they came back with like six options. So yeah. I chose a logo that I thought was pretty strong and sort of resonated across um, healthy and transplant and medical and everybody um, to not be necessarily recognised as a um, charitable position. Um, and then went about ordering some samples and I knew through doing the drink bottle thing in the past mm -hmm. that, you know, order three lots of samples and one lot might be all right, the rest could be crap. And mm -hmm. then having to deal with the companies backward and forth. But I went to a big expo actually that Victoria put on at uh, Jeff Shed, yeah. which is near the casino, a huge big exhibition building. Mm -hmm. And um, they had a lot of international um, people exhibiting mm -hmm. uh, that make products, and so I wandered around and found a couple of the activewear yeah. products, and uh, that was pretty much directly after transplant um, in around October of 2018, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I wandered around there and sort of had a look and found a couple of people that I wanted to get in touch with further, and I, that's a good look, feel, touch yeah. place, so you get to see what they do, and they all had pretty good quality, and I'm, you know, I'm not sure that's the makers of that expedition expo if whether or not they have to vet people but mm -hmm. it seemed like they did and there was a big push for sustainability and doing the right thing through um, fair work and mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff so that was also massively important for me to make sure that you know people are getting paid at the local level in their area and yeah. to pick a factory that was going to comply to all of those things so yeah that was the starting point I met a few factory owners mm -hmm. there and their representatives and then contacted them outside of that and then found one that seemed to communicate well and who was happy to make me some samples mm -hmm. and to go with the colours and, you know, the communication is the main thing, wanting to get responses yeah. and um, getting them to send you the product and that all happened fairly smoothly this time actually, yeah. which was good. Um, and then, yeah, just went from there and designed the outfits through sending photos of things that I liked and sketching up things poorly <laughs> in my free hand and, you know, picking colours through Pantone colours online and sending yeah. them colours and, yeah, that sort of thing. So it was just trial and error, really. Yeah. Um, you've got to get a lot of samples in normally before you get a product that you're satisfied with. Mm. Um, but there weren't too many takes on it, which was pleasant. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously – being a transplant recipient yourself just sort of makes this whole process, you know, uh, such a special idea. Have you stopped to think about how much this could help and mean to other transplant recipients? Not 100%. No, I, I have because I want it to make yeah. people feel confident and yeah. inspire them to 
get fit and to look at people post-transplant who are out living their best life, which is so many of the people that I've met that are just amazing. Um, I really want the people in hospital to see that as the exciting, Mm -hmm. you know, light at the end of the tunnel for them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess I have because, you know, that's really important and to give that kind of hope at an early stage for them would be, you know, great if it can resonate and make a difference at that level. It's it's hard to focus outside and well beyond when you're in those early stages in the transplant gym because, you know, of what you've been through and how hard a slog it's been up to that point. Mm -hmm. But looking forward with, you know, ambition and, you know, seeing people that have done it um, and knowing that it's possible is one of the things I'd like to instil in people early on so that it gives them a bit more motivation to go harder. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we mentioned that about obviously about the Kickstarter campaign. So as of yesterday, it's funded. I know, amazing. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> incredible. Um, I know this is obviously just the very beginning of the journey from some aspect, but how does it make you feel to sort of see it get to this point and to have like, you know, uh, how many people get behind and actually support it. Yeah, it's been an amazing display of support from, like, friends, family, colleagues, and then them sharing it to their outer mm-hmm. circles and networks and it's been very humbling. And, um, yeah, it's amazing. I just can't thank people enough for supporting it. And I think the amount of support so early as well has um, resonated with people that um, it's an idea worth supporting backing and that um absolutely they think it'll make a difference and Mm -hmm. the people that i've spoken to along the way that have been through transplant have also said that they felt that it would help them in their mindset having already been through it and not having anything like that available to them so i think um yeah hopefully it does make a big difference in people's lives and gives them that confidence and Mm -hmm. you know something exciting and also the thought of when you're in that situation that people outside of that group and that network and that circle, if you're in the gym and you're gifted something, it means that people out there are thinking of you and, you know, when they're at the gym wearing their TX Active, living their best life, that, you know, that person has spared a thought whilst purchasing TX Active that there's somebody in rehab having a tough slog and, Mm. you know, they want to support them. So, you know, as a transplant patient, if I had received something like that, I would have been quite touched I think that yeah. there's people out there that care and um yeah that that's what I like about the purpose behind the brand yeah absolutely because you are funded what does that mean for the next step and you know for sort of someone who wants to get involved still like um how can they well they can still um pledge we've got another 12 days on the kickstarter campaign yeah um so they can still pledge which means they are pledging a piece of TX Active clothing for themselves and um, then in turn every two gifts one. Mm -hmm. And beyond that we will have a website which will be up and running and you'll be able to purchase online and we'll still be doing that same philosophy through the online. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it'll be ongoing hopefully. We've got big aims to support uh, transplant patients through some big programs that are available. Like we'd love to work with some other transplant organisations mm-hmm. and supply uniforms for a few events that um, transplanters can get involved with. So that would be our big goal towards, you know, the future. Mm-hmm. Um, there's such a thing as the Australian Transplant Games okay. and the World Transplant Games yeah. where transplanters come together. Um, it's totally different to the Olympics and the Disabled Olympics. It's a different entity entirely, mm-hmm. but it is all about getting out there and moving. So we would love to eventually support everybody that felt that they were wanting to get involved with that. Um, so, yeah, ultimately we really want to do our best to give back to mm-hmm. this group of people who you know, are trying their best to live an active, healthy life and yeah. live their best life going forward. Well, I mean, I might put a little bit of pressure on – I might put a lot of pressure on them right now. It makes sense that the those games, everyone, all the uniforms should be TX active. <laughs> well, I don't know how – I've got to research yet like, <laughs> where they actually get their uniforms from. Um, I haven't gone – too far down that path but yeah. we'd love to sponsor some way or get get involved with creating sponsorships mm. um 
and that sort of thing. But I don't know currently. I mean, I know that they get sponsors mm-hmm. to supply uniforms to people or some, t- some yeah, I just don't know how it all works out. No, that's completely fine. Look, Jade, an absolutely incredible story. You're an incredible person who is doing incredible things and I truly appreciate you coming on to share your story and for, you know, for actually being one of the people who is actually doing something incredibly good um, that's not self-serving. So thank you very much for coming on. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate talking about uh, the TX Active concept and how it all came about. So thanks for chatting. (laughs) 